Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, as, as long as you can see my screen, you're seeing the title of the presentation. And uh, as probably everybody on the call is, is aware, there's a, uh, there's a lot of acronyms around uh, business resiliency. Uh, everything from disaster recovery to incident response to business continuity to business resiliency. And, uh, and today we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about both the differences and the similarities between them. There's a lot that, uh, you know, that allow them to interconnect. And uh, what we've seen in a lot of different places uh, is that there are a lot of people who build completely separate incident response and disaster recovery and business continuity plans. And they, and they go through the exercise over and over again separately um, and they lose some economies of scale because a lot of the plans end up using the same information and even the same people that, uh, that are going to respond to these incidents and recover from them. So what we wanted to talk a little bit about today is what are the differences between the plans and then uh, where can we achieve some of those economies of scale because, uh, because there are similarities between them. Uh, so consider the introduction done. Um, if I uh, if I talk at my normal pace and don't start speeding up, this should you know kind of go through the the presentation very very nicely. If I get to my normal double speed rate, we'll probably be done in about twenty minutes. Uh, but uh, Nick is usually pretty good about uh, about putting on the brakes and slowing me down. Um, we gave the overview. We'll talk a little bit again about disaster recovery, incident response, and business continuity, uh, uh, the differences, the similarities. Uh, and then I have uh, one bonus slide to talk about uh, business impact analysis. And I know there are a couple of people on the call who uh, I've been working with uh, over the last month or so and, and doing quite a few of those. Uh, and it's a critical part of business continuity, but it also really helps out disaster recovery and even incident response. Uh, depending on how you look at it. So we'll look at all those things and then uh, more than likely there'll be a little bit of time left for questions. Of course, as always, you could always reach out to, to Nick or myself or anything if you have any questions about, uh, about the presentation or, uh, or anything else. So let's launch into it. Um, obviously, as I said, you know, disruptions happen. And my, my original slide didn't say disruption. It said something else happens, but uh, it didn't get past the sensors. So, uh, so we changed it to disruptions, but really, uh, I've been I've been working. I came from the the bank and credit union world uh, almost twenty five years ago. At this point, I started working there, and uh, and plans were very very different back then on how to respond and recover. Now we're dealing with uh, uh, most uh, many many environments, if not all environments, are in the cloud and the ability to work from home. And it really has kind of upended, and not to mention COVID, has kind of upended some of the response and recovery plans that have gone in. But that doesn't change the fact that organizations need to be prepared to be able to kind of turn on a dime if one of these incidents should happen. Um, obviously, if the business can't function properly, uh, they lose revenue in business. They take a reputational hit, and we've all seen uh, uh, companies in the news, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a cyber attack or a fire burns them to the ground, uh, it, it, you know, the, the loss of uh, being able to function it can put the business out of business. So um, there are three in the, in the triangle of response plans that most people are aware of and deal with. Um, disaster recovery, business continuity, and incident response. You will see acronyms all over the place for BCP, DRP, IRP. T means plan. Um, I usually say business continuity plan, BCP, um, but I use BCP just for business continuity as well. So as I'm talking, if you, if you hear me use those acronyms, I'm probably using them interchangeably. Um, and again, as I said earlier, uh, although they do all have common components and we will get into them. They all have different critical functions within the organization. Um, and depending on what the organization is, they can look very, very different from place to place. But the ultimate goal is to have not just a single response. Um, it's a snowstorm, so we're working from home. 
but we want to be able to respond to multiple different types of events, cyber events, weather events, uh, tragedy events, pandemics. Um, and bear in mind, these plans are not meant to go line by line in an area that's ever been thought of. Um, think of these as a guide to be able to uh, you know, make decisions quickly and get information that you need to be able to move forward. Um, one of the things but before we get to the next slide is I had mentioned the, the plans changing an awful lot and um, plans can be very, very different based on sizes and scopes of organizations. I've seen organizations that have 150 page business continuity plans. I've seen organizations that have 10 pages of business continuity plans. And so this is really even more so than, than security policies and things like that, which can be built from templates. Um, a lot of the resiliency plans really need to take your organization into account. So they don't necessarily, uh, you know, they don't have to be a hundred pages, uh, but they have to be able to allow you to respond to certain situations and recover from certain, certain situations. What we're also finding is that um, as organizations grow larger and larger, things like business continuity plans get more and more unwieldy. So what we've started doing at Compass, and, and we've seen at other organizations as well, of course, is that a main plan could be, you know, 10 or 15 pages of critical information that the enterprise can use. But they'll also have um, what we refer to as run books or playbooks in critical areas so that uh, you actually have a decentralized way of responding to an event once somebody has, you know, has gone through. You still have the teams, you still have going through, but in terms of recovery and responding to certain areas, um, uh, you know, depending, again, depending on the size of the organization, you might want to be able to split, chunk these out a little bit. Um, but that's a, a slightly different conversation for a different time. Um, we're going to start with disaster recovery plan and, and what I call the, the granddaddy of them all. Um, back in the day before, uh, you know, even before computers and things like that, you could have a disaster recovery plan. What happens if and what happens if there's a fire? What happens if there's a flood? Um, snowstorms are a little bit less common uh, for uh, today as, as a true disaster because unless you have a, cu a true customer facing element, um, uh, COVID kind of proved that you, know, you work from home if there's a problem and you get your stuff done. But they're all, uh, you know, disaster recovery plans are basically built to respond to a scenario where you restore critical uh, critical functions. Take it into today and a disaster recovery plan really concentrates on critical IT functions. A DR plan for most companies is probably the most IT centric plan that you're going to see. And uh, because recovering IT infrastructure is an IT function, there's no other way to, to take a look at that. Uh, the objective is to, you know, if you lose a server, if you lose a server farm, if you lose a data center, um, even if you get hit by ransomware, uh, the, even though incident response kicks in, you're probably going to use the disaster recovery plan if you have systems that you have to recover and restore. Um, so the objective, as it says on the slide, is to recover, rebuild, and restore IT assets to the operational state. Now, it kind of stops there because you've recovered from the disaster. You've got the IT assets back to the state they were before the disaster. Now, uh, as an old IT guy, in my opinion, it used to be a lot more difficult to do this than it is today. We used to cut, we used to have figure um, with bare metal restores and we had to bring up the operating system. Then we had to install all the programs. Then we had to get the data files. Then we had to get the users. Um, thanks to virtualization, and, and cloud functions and a lot of wonderful advances in technology. Sometimes this can be flipping a switch or you know, downloading what the latest backup was. And you can have multiple sites brought back in a, in a little amount of time as possible. So, and, and the activities, you know, are we backing up data? We're covering systems. 
possibly depending on the size and scope of the disaster, you may be looking at turning up your alternative data site, if you have one, um, and infrastructure restoration. So with the disaster recovery plan, there are some best practices to take a look at, you know, uh, and they're going to, we'll talk a little bit about them in some of the similarities, but one is, do you have a, uh, a recovery team? Um, in smaller places, you may not, it may all be one person for IT that is, is recovering. In the larger organizations, though, um, having one person can be a single point of failure. So you want to have a recovery team. Somebody might be responsible for network. Somebody might be responsible for data. Uh, you know, somebody might be responsible for recovering endpoints. Those are all components of a DR plan. You want to be able to identify uh, you know, kind of what the risks are and what order you want to do the recovery in. Uh, in the old days, you, you kind of knew you had to, you know, you had to have the network first, then you had to build, uh, make sure the connectivity was up, then you had to build certain aspects of a domain controller and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, you know, and if you do it out of order, you're going to cause more problems than you can solve. So um, obviously, disaster recovery plan is it very heavily depends on backups. If you can't restore the data, restoring the hardware and software is only 35% of what you need. If you don't have any data, you're, you're probably, you've got a long slog ahead of you to try and restore stuff. And then uh, from a DR standpoint, test, 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 test. I, I can't say that enough. Um, a disaster recovery plan from an IT infrastructure standpoint is one of the easier things to be able to actually test, make sure the backups are working, uh, make sure if you have uh, backup internet lines that you can fail over to them. If you have an alternative data site, can you fail over to it? Uh, if, if, it's a, if it's not a hot site, if it's a cold site, can you spin it up? Um, if it's a warm site, are you just moving data over? Making sure and taking these exercises and doing this testing on a regular basis is going to be critical when something actually happens, because that's not when you want to find out that something has failed. Um, so you, you take these testing opportunities as often as you can get them to make sure that your backups are working, your restores are working, and that you can respond as necessary. So that's kind of disaster recovery. Again, these are very, very high overviews. We could get you know way down deep into some of the areas but uh, that's, that's kind of the view from the wing on, on the disaster recovery plan. Next, we go into um, near and dear to the security person's heart, the incident response plan. Unlike the DR plan, which a, uh, you can have a security event cause uh, the need to use the disaster recovery plan, but an incident response plan primarily and predominantly focuses on security incidents. If you've had a ransomware incident, if you've had a breach, uh, if, if data is stolen, if you've had an inside uh, threat, uh, these are all things that could trigger your incident response plan. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, even, even physical security breaches uh, where people come in and use social engineering attacks could trigger an incident response plan. Where, uh, where disaster recovery is restoring the IT infrastructure and bringing back the systems to a usable state, the objective of the incident response plan, well, there, there are multiple objectives. One is, uh, can you minimize the impact of, of whatever happens to be happening? Uh, restoring normal operations, and that's where DR could come in, um, ensuring safety and security of data, employees, uh, and uh, and the environment itself, because there are security threats that could, uh, you know, that, that absolutely can uh, affect the safety and security of things around. Um, for an incident response plan, there's kind of a, a roadmap and a framework that most of them use. Uh, there are uh, several key steps in an incident response plan, and uh, they may be called things that are slightly different, but they all have some form of, of the, the following. Um, the first is preparation. And uh, plan preparation is, do you have an incident response policy? Do you have processes involved to be able to 
uh, you know, kind of go through and and handle the rest of the events. So preparation, uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's nebulous, but at the same time, it means when this hits, do you have steps involved to be able to respond to it? Um, while the actual event is going on or possibly after you get into identification um, identification is has something malicious actually happened if it has what's happened um, it, you know identification is you're probably looking at uh, you know scan files and log files uh, alerts from different systems um, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of clues coming in after you've identified an incident you want to contain the incident. Uh, containment could be, hey, we, you know, I've seen uh, containment exercises where they shut the network down for a whole building because they don't want to spread to alternate buildings. Um, there are many, you know, tools have gotten better and better now. There are um, third-party SOC tools and monitoring tools where they can detect uh, what appears to be a ransomware issue and automatically shut down the system before it can spread, before it can get to certain areas. So um, could be short-term, could be long-term, but the goal of containment is to make sure that whatever is happening doesn't spread throughout the organization. I got and a question you, for you, Derek. Yes, Sorry sure. to interrupt you. Uh, do virtual servers, et cetera, fall under the testing scenario that should be done periodically? What about if they server as uh, serve as a backup? Uh, virtual, so virtual servers to me is a server, just like any other server is, uh, if you, you know, from a DR standpoint, um, in a lot of cases, a virtual server should be something that you can recreate, whether you're, um, if it's a VM server, if you have a snapshot of it, or if you're doing, you know, usually the, the snapshot, sometimes they don't always, you know, get all the data. They're usually data backups in addition to the snapshots. But I would say, uh, you know, treat just because something is virtual doesn't mean that it's it's doesn't need to be tested and make sure it works. Because if you lose the virtual environment, um, uh, you know, if you lose those servers that are that are hosts and and going through all that, be they in the cloud or be they in a data center or be they local, you're still going to need to be able to recover them one way or the other. Perfect. Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone, if you want to pose any questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat and I will ask Derek, I'll interrupt him in the middle of his sentence and we'll get that question out there. A little odd, but okay. I can, I can <laughs> work on the fly that way. Um, we we're talking about containment. Obviously after containment, um, we're looking at eradication and eradication is just, you know, getting rid of whatever was affecting the systems. It, it could be ransomware. It could be a virus. Um, it could be bringing systems back to whatever system normal is, although that kind of comes in with recovery as well. But think of it in terms of, of security incidents and, uh, and, and areas like that. Um, so, and, and one of the things about eradication is you want to make sure it's free from whatever infected the system or whatever happened to the system so that it doesn't repropagate and start to spread again. Um, recovery, well, we kind of covered that with disaster recovery, what's involved with that. It's bringing the systems back to a, an operational state, bringing back data uh, as far as, you know, the backups are concerned to be able to do this. Um, the, the good news is backups and, and recovery systems, as I said before, have gotten much better uh, over, over the years. And so normally now, uh, there were times where stuff was only backed up once a week. Most uh, most organizations I see backups are daily, and so you're not going to lose more than 24 hours, which is great. Um, and and the recovery uh, is, uh, you know, if if endpoints are being uh, being virtualized, it's very easy to bring those back. Um, if images are used, it doesn't take long at all to to bring back a system into into what's normal. And then um, lesson learned in a post mortem. These are very important things because after an attack or a security incident or anything else like that, you really want to take a look and say, uh, have we figured out, do we know how to do this better? Could we have prevented this from happening? Um, or what did we learn that will allow us to prevent this from happening? So there are a couple of different reasons for a good lessons learned in a postmortem. One, 
is to analyze, you know, could we have been better uh, and, uh, and, and go through and prevent things, put controls in place so this won't happen again. But it can also be used to improve the plan itself. If we learn something as part of this, that, hey, if we see this, you know, if we see this uh, uh, string coming through the log files, we know there's a good chance it's an attack. You can set up those log files to alert you as soon as it happens, where it may not have been set as an alert earlier. Um, so as much as I hate to admit it, there's a lot you can learn from these security incidents that go through. Um, key activities, incident reporting, communication protocols, evidence gathering. Um, I probably should have put communication protocols in red. Uh, you know, communicating is uh, throughout the incident is is absolutely key uh, to understand, you know, where you are from, a, you know, from uh, where the incident is, what stage it's in, um, who knows about it, uh, who's responded to. We'll get into a little bit of that when we get into the similarities of the plans. But uh, I would say, off of you know, you have a lot of IT stuff, but uh, you don't necessarily want the people who are working to fix it or contain it be having to give 15 minute updates to everybody. So having a team again is key on doing this and, and we'll take a look like that. And then again, at the end, many people think uh, incident response is all about IT and don't get me wrong, IT is certainly front and center in this, but a, a good incident response plan really goes throughout the whole enterprise because you do need, there are going to be people, if it's a ransomware attack or anything else like that, you may need to talk to the press. I guarantee you don't want most IT people talking to press um, for, I, I can list far too many reasons. It's not an insult to IT people. Uh, we tend to be very honest and very straightforward. And, and sometimes what you need is someone to be able to explain a situation and discuss it, not to mention if legal uh, things get into place. Besides, you want the IT guys probably doing one of the earlier steps. And so we're going to jump now into uh, into the big one, business continuity plan. Um, now, business continuity plan actually has components of the other two kind of baked into it. But the big thing about business continuity is it's the overall uh, uh, restoration and continuation of Critical, the, the critical business functions that allow you to, to run your business, not only after a disruption, bringing it back, disaster recovery, but during this, a disruption is while something happens to be going on, if it's a security incident, if it's a, you know, if, if it's a fire, if it's a flood or anything else like that, can you still operate? Um, and, and that's what the business continuity plan talks about doing. Um, and although that is, you know, that's kind of a textbook, the, the first bullet is a textbook definition. Um, I usually also stress that an overlooked function is the safety in, of the staff and the customers. One of the reasons we have these plans is so that people aren't injured, uh, you know, or, or hurt and, and customers are not injured or hurt, especially if things happen, uh, you know, um, uh, in person. And, and in a brick and mortar environment. But, uh, you know, uh, COVID kind of brought that out with a pandemic section. And if you look at BCPs that have pandemic plans, a lot of them talk about safety of the workers and, and safety of the customers. Um, so that's very important. Normally you will see a pandemic plan as part of the overall business continuity plan. It's one of the scenarios on how to respond to it. Sometimes you'll see it broken out but it really does fit with general business continuity because that's kind of the whole point of it. Um, so again, a cyber incident could absolutely trigger the business continuity plan. We do tests all the time where we start with a cyber incident and we grow it to the level that it becomes that you have to enact the business continuity plan. Uh, a cyber incident where three machines are affected, probably you don't activate a BCD. Um, a cyber incidents where it takes out two buildings and nobody has access to any data, the BCP plan is absolutely hit at that point. As I said earlier, you know, remote work and cloud environments have made BCP much easier. Um, you don't necessarily have to respond with 17 pages of this is how we do it. Um, 
we've, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with BCP recently, and it's what happens in this scenario. And half the time, the answer is we send everybody home and they VPN into the cloud and they work from work from home. That's a perfectly example, a per perfectly acceptable solution. Um, the objective of a BCP plan is to be able to continue your products and services with minimal impact to the, the customer and in the environment. Um, key critical activities, risk assessment. We will talk about this in a few minutes. Business impact analysis. We will talk about that in a few minutes. Um, how to allocate resources and crisis communication. You're going to see communication throughout this presentation. Um, I can't stress enough that a good uh, business resiliency plan, um, be it IR, BCP, DR, um, you communicate with the people inside and outside your organization. That's just as important as bringing up the services. Final line in red, um, where a DR plan is very IT centric, where an incident response plan has a decent amount of um, IT in most cases, depending on the incident. Um, a BCP plan cannot be effective without senior management and the entire enterprise uh, taking play, you know, uh, uh, participating. Um, and it's one of the reasons that when we do BCP plans, when we help out building them or revising them or going through, we talk to all the business units. We get the buy-in. We have to understand what they're doing, what their critical functions are, and what needs to come back first, um, or what needs to keep running no matter what. If we lose 95% of the things out there, these final five can't ever go down. And, and that's how you build the plan. Quick question for you, Derek. Yeah. Um, the audience. What advice or tips would you give in identifying your business's essential services and functions when uh, doing business continuity planning? So that uh, a perfect exercise to do that is the business impact analysis. And I actually have a slide on that later. If uh, you know, if uh, would, uh, several slides coming in, um, I think that's the next to the last slide. We will touch on this. If I don't address it, and you'd like more, uh, let me know near the closer to the close of the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, and this is just a this is just a wrap up. Uh, disaster recovery, incident response, BCP. Um, on occasion, they're all rolled into a business resiliency plan, but you know. DR supports BCP. Incident response feeds into disaster recovery and BCP efforts. Business continuity provides you know, a framework for DR and incident response to be able to use. So they're all interconnected. I probably should have drawn like a cute little triangle graphic and things like that, but um, I'm a talker, not a drawer. So I, it, it would be terrible. It would look like chicken scratch and things like that. But the, the bottom line that you can take away is that they all have uh, some similar components that can be used, even though at the end of the day, they all have different functions um, that, that they support. So now we've, then we've talked about kind of what they are and you've seen kind of the differences. Um, we're going to talk about those economies of scale that, uh, that I spoke about earlier and um, what is similar across all the plans and, uh, and, and going through. So... Uh, the first thing, and uh, you know, I know you guys are shocked with being uh, ISACA members, but the first thing we think is very, very important across all three are risk assessments. And since ISACA people are all about risk, um, and I happen to be an SVP of, of uh, risk management and, uh, and, and compliance, I figured putting that at the top of the list isn't a bad thing. But all three disciplines, you know, one of the best ways to figure out what your critical functions are is, you know, take, you know, take a risk assessment. What are the threats to your organization? Um, is, is your threat, the, you know, the loss of customers? If your threat is, if you have a brick and mortar, is your biggest threat a fire or, you know, or a robbery or a flood or, or you know, if you're a virtual company that deals with credit card information, is your biggest threat a cyber attack? Figuring out what these threats are to your organization and what the impact is will allow you to go to the next step, which basically says, okay, based on this threat, my most vulnerable function, my most vulnerable piece of equipment is X. So, you know, uh, you know, is, uh, for a BCP risk, it could be flood or fire or theft. For an incident response risk, it could be ransomware or a breach. 
Um, for a disaster recovery, it could be a, a critical server. It could be uh, a SQL server with all your data on it. Um, and, and so take a look at where your biggest threats are and that will get us to, um, hey, once we figured out that, then what are these functions that we're doing and how do we protect or enhance them? And, and we will get, when we get into the BIAs, it'll get a little bit more in depth in that. Another question for you, Derek. Yes, sir. What do you recommend for storing these plans and who would maintain them and be the holder to the plans? So um, well, we're, we're, we'll, we'll jump ahead a little bit, but um, when, when we talk about uh, one of the things that the, the similarities between, uh, between all three plans is you wanna have a good team. And in most cases, what I found is your incident response team and your business continuity team are very, very close, if not identical, the identical people across them. They're usually, um, uh, you know, operations managers and senior team people and, and then IT people. The, the DR plan is more IT centric. Uh, uh, you know, the, the recommendation for the, the plans themselves into where to store them Um in the old days, in the banking days, we used to, you know, we used to buy uh, Tupperware uh, containers and lock them in a fire king in a basement and, uh, and make sure we had, you know, canned food and all this other stuff. It's a little bit different today. Um, I, I know people that have given them out on USB keys to everybody on the senior team and say, take this home. And, and this is the current, this is this year's copy of the plan to be able to do that. I have people who store them in the cloud. The goal here is to have them on your systems, of course, but you want to be able to access them if your systems are unavailable. So it could be as something as simple as, as have it up in, uh, you know, uh, you know, you could put it in a Dropbox area or, or anything else like that. If you have a cloud presence, you can put it up in the cloud or um, you, can, uh, you can hand them out to each of your senior team members once a year uh, or, or whenever you update the plan and say, you know, put this in a drawer in your house, if we need it, we're calling you. Um, and actually that kind of, you know, we talk about uh, uh, planning and pre preparedness. Um, it includes the, you know, these, these plans would include the documented procedures, roles and responsibilities, and the, and the definition of the, the communication channels. Um, uh, you know, if you lose your main uh, setup, uh, your phone system, or, or, you know, internet's down, everything else like that. How do you communicate with not only your team for, you know, your BCP or your IR team? Um, how do you communicate with customers or clients? Uh, how do you communicate with uh, internal staff? Uh, do you use email? Do you use voice? Do you use text? Do you use a website? Um, that's all part of the plan, you know, the exercise in the plan. Just bear in mind this, this what you know, we're not going, we're not going to do a deep dive into how to, you know, how to build a whole plan. Um, but those are key elements to, to take a look at. Um, again, they vary. One of the reasons uh, there isn't a boilerplate for some of this is because they really do vary. What I've found lately is I find uh, so much more cloud environment and remote work that, uh, you know, uh, where if I'm working with a bank or credit union, phone system is critical. If I'm working with somebody that's a cloud presence and they have 25 people that work from home, they're all doing cell phones and they all are doing internet and, and phone doesn't even enter into the plan in any way, shape or form. So it really does depend on the vertical that you're working in um, will, will drive a lot of these answers. Um, testing and exercises. I can't, uh, again, on the, on the DR, I stress this over and over. For incident response in BCP, it's a little, uh, you know, it's it's hard to, to, to do an incident, a live incident, you know, to create an incident. You probably want to avoid putting ransomware on systems to see how people respond to it. Um, but uh, there are, uh, you know, Compass and, and uh, does lots of tabletop testing and uh, and running through the exercises and and seeing, you know, uh, simulations and, 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 and drills to validate the plans and see where we could possibly improve them. Now where a DR exercise, you could, there's a lot of functional stuff you can do um, because then you're recovering systems and, and making sure things are working. 
Uh, for business continuity and incident response, we do a lot more tabletop testing. And those are scenarios that we can come up with with the assistance of the, of the organization in question to give them a, a mock scenario and facilitate and, and say, if this should happen, if, if, a, if a flood flooded you know, three feet of water into the basement of your, of your organization, um, if a fire swept through the top floor, if ransomware came in and took out two thirds of your, uh, two -thirds of your team uh, systems, how do you respond? And one of the reasons you want to test these, uh, you know, I've seen people give answers that had absolutely nothing to do with their current plans. I've had, uh, you know, depending on who's in the room, you get different answers. You also start to see some single points of failure. If you have one person answering 95% of the questions, normally I'll pivot and say, okay, this person just got hit on the head with a brick from the, uh, you know, from the earthquake that happened and is out. So he's not talking or she's not talking for the rest of the uh, rest of the exercise. Let's see um, what other answers we come up. So, and, and the goal though, stress is uh, the, the test and the exercises, these are not pass fail. Recovery of a system can be pass fail. If you, if you fail to recover a system that fails, but you're doing a tabletop test. The goal is knowledge. The goal is to find out either what you don't know or, uh, oh, we have, we didn't consider safety deposit boxes in, in, you know, in our, in our plan that we don't have a backup. There's no recovery for that. Or even, uh, you know, oh, we, we noticed that if, if our phone system is down, we don't have any way to fail over. Um, so the testing and exercises not only gives you uh, the ability to update your plan, but they also can identify key gaps that you may not have thought of that if an actual disaster happens, it could put you in dire straits. So don't think of the test and the exercise as something to fail or something that you did badly. One of the, you know, one of the best things I saw was a testing exercise where they had 17 high findings. Um, and I said, that was spectacular. Did you fix them? I said, yep. I said that this was one of the best tests you've ever done. So. Um, I have another question for you before you start that next please. slide. You're going to yep. have to put on your lawyer hat for this. And this was actually, I think this exact topic was brought up at the workshop we did last night. I'm not sure if you were here for this portion of it, Derek, but I once heard that email should be avoided for IR communications because it is subject to subpoena and can and will be used you will be used against you in the event of litigation. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, anything is subject to subpoena. So uh, now if you're, so in terms of incident response, I would, I would couch it by saying, if you have secure information, if you're sharing information about customers or, or credit card numbers or anything else like that, email is not a good way to communicate. Um, you want to think of the, uh, think of the security of the data that you're communicating back and forth. Uh, and that doesn't, and that's not limited to uh, an incident that hap is happening in an organization. That's every day. There's actually something in PCI that says, are you, you know, if you're, if you're sharing this information, are you sharing it securely? Are you not using insecure uh, methods of sharing? And as an example of an insecure method of sharing, it says email. So, the you're uh, not putting on the lawyer hat. I can just put on the security hat and say yes. That's uh, you know your be the best practice is is to keep um, uh, keep email communication at a high level and and not share data. Now, if you're saying hey, uh, uh, you know we had an incident and uh, and everybody was uh, you know, the customers decided to sue and they subpoenaed uh, communication efforts. Well, yes. Yes, they absolutely can. So the question is then, if you don't want to use uh, communication, what could you use to, uh, you know, to share information back and forth and track that information as well? So um, the, the lawyer had in me, which, uh, you know, is very, very small um, and doesn't fit my head, says, I think at this point, they can probably uh, subpoena any communication with the email it's, you know, uh, I, for me, it's completely different is it's a retention thing. How long do you keep, you know, if you keep stuff from five years ago, the subpoena could go back five years and you had to get, you have to give them five years of information. If, um, 
versus some of this uh, for some of this other stuff. So it's a combination of retention and everything else like that. But um, but yes, the, the the bottom line is absolutely they could do it, and I would keep you know I wouldn't put critical uh, customer information or critical uh, PII or EPHI or anything else like that in email if I can possibly avoid it. Uh, but we're, we're actually at the next bullet, which is communication. Um, and all three, again, uh, uh, all three of these plans talk about communication protocols. What's the escalation procedure? How do you coordinate among the internal teams um, and, and the stakeholders? This is really uh, probably, to me, one of the biggest areas of the plan. Uh, because the IT guys are either fixing or analyzing or, uh, you know, holding things together with spit and bailing wire. And so you're not going to tap them. You, you probably don't want to tap them. And they'll probably be very grumpy if they keep getting called into a boardroom or into calls with 27 people to have to explain things. So you want a coordinator to be able to communicate with senior management. You want somebody designated CFO, CEO, head of marketing to communicate with outside stakeholders. Um, you want to have uh, plans in place to be, you know, you could even have based on the incident, you could probably even have some stock responses that you need to go through. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but communicating both with internal stakeholders, with the staff to say, hey, don't come in today because X, or we're going to send you home, or here's what's happening. And uh, and then having regular updates. When we, I've gone through several incidents, um, and, and one in particular, uh, I said, listen, I will update you first thing in the morning and at noon and when I go home, uh, because this this happened to be several days where we were, were doing a bunch of things. I said, if you need more than that, you know, let's figure that out now and you can, you know, we can assign somebody and they can come see me or whatever, but but don't come to me every 20 minutes and ask me for an update. I will give you, you know, full write-ups, but you need to let me work on stuff between that. Um, having that in place ahead of time is, and, and having it understood makes a huge impact on, okay, IT can work IT. Marketing and, and the CEO can work on communication. Uh, you know, if we need, uh, you know, if we need assets, if we need this, if we need that, we can have, you know, other people go procure. Having roles and responsibilities and, and communication inside and outside the organization can't be understated for all of these plans. Um, and a, a couple more that goes along with, uh, with the last ones, uh, training and awareness, which basically goes hand in hand in testing. We just talked about all the different things, communication, Who's going to, you know, who, who's in charge of communicating? Who's in charge of being able to declare a disaster? Who's in charge of insurance? Um, those are all roles and responsibilities. But, uh, you know, being aware of those roles and responsibilities is just as important. So having a training on these plans, usually what the, the way I run my testing is, uh, most of my testing involves training of some, you know, in, in some fashion is saying, for an incident response, you know, you want to have these in and this is what you want to think of and this is what you want to consider. So normally my exercises are probably, you know, 60% exercise and 40% training and, and awareness of them. So, but it really does play a vital role because when the rubber hits the road, knowing what your role is and your responsibility is, is going to save hours rather than having something assigned. Um, documentation, documentation and reporting. Uh, that incident I was talking to you about, um, I was a, I was a third party. I was, I was working as a, as a contractor on. And one of the nice things about their incident response plan is they had a four page uh, form for incidents. And uh, you could go, I could go through the whole form. And then they had free text where I said, here's the status updates. But it actually had a checklist. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? And I was actually just going right down the, the list and saying, yep, all this is done. Here's where we did this. Here's the result of this. And so having the, you know, one, documenting the incident is critical. And now it's, it's you know, especially for, uh, a lot of the security incidents now, it, it's required. And so breaches have to be reported within 36 hours for a lot of organizations. Um, 
and uh, and so there's a lot. Uh, any any regulated organization at this point basically has structures that they have to do. If you have document, if you have forms and the ability to report off and make it easier, so somebody's not writing a, a notebook or having to do that, um, I found it's so much easier. And just reading the form gives you an idea of what you should be doing. Um, it's like, oh, I forgot to, I, I didn't check that. Let me go, let me go back and make sure that's working. Um, it can be again. It, it think of it like an accordion. Tiny companies could have a, a, a form that's one page. You know, I've seen forms that are four or five and said, hey, if it's a if it's a breach, fill out this section. If it's a if it's a ransomware, fill out this section. Uh, if somebody you know got angry and locked you out of all your own systems and then quit, fill out this section. Um, and continuous improvement. That's you know, it's all that means is you should be looking at these plans at least once a year. Organizations are so nimble today and they make so many changes so quickly that in a year, what was a, a solid process might have nothing to do with things going through the next year. So at least once a year review and make sure you haven't made any significant changes, but um, update, update it at least annually based on the, the testing that you've done. And if you have made significant changes to the organization, um, then incorporate those into the plans. So it's a living, breathing document that's, that's, that should be updated on a regular basis. All right, so we're close to the end and, and we've got about 12 minutes to go. So I did say, uh, one of the questions we got was, you know, how do we define all this stuff? And, and so uh, we've been working a, a lot in the past year or so, we've, we've gotten a lot of work for uh, setting up what's called business impact analysis statements. And all that means is really uh, what you want to do is you want to identify your critical functions and, and figure out a couple of things about them to help with all these plans. Um, we talked a little bit about identifying business functions and processing. What are, and it's, you know, for, for functions and processes, what are the functions of the business? So in finance, here's, here's the one I always use as my default. And I know at least one person is on this call that she's just going to roll her eyes because she's heard this 18 times in the last two weeks. For accounting, payroll is a critical function. If you don't pay your employees, bad things are going to happen. Um, what else do you have in finance? Well, account receivable and accounts payable. Is that a critical function? It could be. I've had it be yes in some cases. I've had it be no in some cases. So the you know one of the things we do is we go through and we look at, at you know each one of the business units and we talk to them and we say, hey, if you couldn't do X tomorrow, how badly would it affect the business? Oh, well, if I couldn't do this, oh, it's not that big a deal. We could wait a couple of days versus, oh, if I couldn't do this, and I'll go back to banking because it's kind of easy to use examples. Um, if we couldn't do wires, if we couldn't do ACH um, in 24 hours, we have big problems. We've got really angry customers. Funds aren't moving back and forth. Uh, you know, at best we can, you know, make some some little manual things but we're we're really screwed those are critical functions the you know and and this is where it becomes a uh, you know a, an all encompassing sort of thing you want everybody's input because the people who are doing the daily work on all this are probably going to be able to come up with what my what are the most important things i do right away um versus that if you have it trying to do this it's going to, the, the list is going to be completely different. I guarantee it. So get the business units buy-in involved early. Um, once you have those functions, you talk about uh, recovery time objectives. How long can you be down before there's a significant impact? Uh, this affects both disaster recovery and business continuity. Recovery point, how much data can you afford to lose? Luckily in this day and age, most data is backed up on a daily basis. So the point should be 24 hours. Um, but not in every case. What are the strategy objectives? If you are down, if you can't perform payroll, what happens after a day? What's your strategy? Well, we don't do anything. We only pay up somebody every other week. So, okay, well, what if the system goes down, uh, you know, the day before payday? Oh, well, you know, it, we have a, we have a two day window that we can get in. Oh, okay. That's good. Um, so for 24 hours, you're good. Yeah, we think we're good. All right, what about 72 hours? Oh, well, then we're not good. Do you have any way to work around it? Well, I guess we could, uh, you know, 
we could write out checks for the employees off, you know, X account and, and have that work. Oh, that's a workaround. Do you have it written down? Nope. All right. So that's one of the things you want to write down and put in the plan. So if the person answering the question isn't there, you know what to be done. Um, and then, you know, as, as part of the impact analysis is what's the impact that, you know, we talk about the impact of disruptions. How bad is it going to be? How much money is it going to cost you? How much goodwill is it going to cost you? Uh, take a look at dependencies. In this day and age, can you work without a computer, a phone, and internet? Probably not. But, you know, I can work without a printer. I have one, but it's, you know, it's not a big deal if I lose it. That might not be the case for everybody. Um, I don't have a lot of other physical things that I need. However, you know, one of my dependencies is we have a, a, a we use ShareFile as our, uh, you know, uh, as our record retention area. So if we lost access to that, that's a big, you know, I can only do whatever I happen to have on my machine at the time, which means I lose all that. That's a dependency. You take all those, uh, you could have 10, you could have 20 critical functions. And based on how long you can be down for and, uh, you know, and what the impact of the disruption is, you prioritize them and say, okay, these five things I want up in less than eight hours because there's a huge impact if we're down for more. Now, it may cost money to be able to achieve that. It may cost less if you say, okay, I want them up within 24 hours. But the key is to prioritize them. What's coming up first? IT is pretty good at that um, because they go back to DR and they say, hey, from a DR standpoint, um, I got to get A up before I pill up B. I got to get B up before I bring up C. And then, you know, usually the last things that come up are the workstations and the users. I got to get my network. I got to get my servers. I got to get my databases up. Then I'll work on this. This is no different, but you think of it from a business standpoint is if you had 80 things that, you know, on the list, if you could get, keep five of them running the whole way through, it's, you're not that bad. And, and that's kind of what you're looking to do. And then, of course, once you've gone through all these exercises, you want to document your findings and the recommendations because that will allow you to build your DCP plan. Um, now, I know in an hour, there's, there's not a lot of time to be able to go through and, uh, and, and you know, delve into this. I could have done an hour in each one of these and done a lot more. What I really wanted to show was kind of they're different. They work differently, but there's a lot that can be used interdependently with each other. You know, if you get a risk assessment and BIAs and critical functions and everything else together, you can build any one of these plans with this sort of stuff because, you know, roles and responsibilities and everything, they all tie in together. Um, you need all three components to, to manage the disruptions at this point. Um, and being proactive and going through these exercises is going to save you so much time and effort at the end. Another question. So, yeah, I've got, we've got six. I, I wanted to give a couple of minutes just in case. So I'm, yeah. I'm sorry if I was talking extra fast. No, that was perfect. Perfect duration. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, put them in the chat now. I have a first one here for you to start off with. How is maximum allowable downtime different from recovery time objective? So uh, a recovery time objective is it, they're they're similar, but maximum allowable downtime is uh, basically how long can we be down really before we're screwed, um, and and before there's a severe impact of this. Uh, uh, recovery uh, time objective says okay, based on our organization, we should be able to bring this up in eight hours. It's going to take me that long to build whatever I need to, you know, recover, put the data back on, have it ready to go. It's going to take eight hours. That's great because our maximum allowable downtime is 24, which means our customers are going to be burning down the building and, you know, at hour 26. So in an ideal world, your recovery time objective is shorter than your maximum allowable downtime. If your maximum allowable downtime is 24 hours and your IT guy says it's going to take me 36 to bring that up, you're probably going to be either spending some money, getting a new IT guy, or finding a new process. 
um, because you've you've already pointed out that we're going to suffer big time and we're going to have 12 hours where it's not working and our customers are going to be really, really angry. 